Every few years, we hear of the rapid spread of a new disease that strikes fear in our heart. Ebola, Zika, SARS, Nipah, MERS and all it will take is one cough, one bite, one touch for any of our lives to change. Data shows that the number of new diseases per decade has increased nearly fourfold over the past 60 years. And since 1980, the number of outbreaks per year has more than tripled. And when these diseases cross borders and become global, they are called pandemics. In this episode, we are going to explore pandemics to understand how they work and how they are contained. We will focus on swine flu and AIDS as well as the history of how pandemics spread like the plague or smallpox. How do these diseases affect agriculture by infecting animal and plant populations and how can they be used as weapons? Keep watching to understand the science of pandemics and biological disasters. We start off our journey into pandemics with a man arriving at an airport in 2009 from the US. He is carrying a virus, a kind of influenza on him called swine flu or H1N1. During the checks at the airport, the man was quarantined. Nonetheless, the virus spread, more confirmed cases were reported and with the first deaths due to swine flu in India and Pune, panic began to spread. Now where did this bug originate? Clearly from a pig. The first case was in Wisconsin in 2005, where a young boy contracted the flu from some pigs in a slaughterhouse where he worked. He recovered quite soon and so one heard little about the virus for quite a while. Let's flash forward to Mexico in 2009. A host of cases of what appeared to be normal flu surfaced across Mexico. By April, over 900 cases were reported. This was the same bug that infected the boy in Wisconsin. It was now known as swine flu or the H1N1 virus. The World Health Organization declared this an epidemic. By June 11, over 30,000 cases were confirmed in 74 countries. It was now a pandemic, or the worldwide spread of a new disease. What exactly is swine flu? It is a kind of influenza. Influenza is basically a respiratory disease caused by the influenza virus. There are four kinds of influenza, A, B, C and D. We are interested in influenza A, which is found in animals and birds and can then affect humans. So avian flu starts off in birds like ducks, geese and fowl. Swine flu starts off by infecting the respiratory tract of pigs. From here, the virus changes form. This mutated virus can infect humans who are in contact with the animal or bird. It then spreads from human to human through the air and then through contact with the infected objects. Now for the nomenclature. Viruses are categorized by the proteins found on their surface which are usually of two types. Hemagglutinin or H and neuraminidase or N. There are many kinds of H's and N's. So when the H is from category 1 and the N is from category 1, it becomes H1N1. When you don the H5N1 jacket, it becomes bird flu. And then there is H3N2 and H7N9. The list goes on. Really need to learn to manage our H's and N's, right? This virus, to cause a pandemic, has to have two very important aspects. One is that the virus has to be novel. In other words, mankind should not have been exposed to it. And secondly, it should have good chance of human-to-human -human spread. If I get the infection and I cough, I should be able to give it to someone else. And that's how the chain starts. This was the case with H1N1. What was truly remarkable was how fast the virus spread. Within a few weeks of its detection, it had already reached all the continents. The initial panic of 2009 has now died. 
Today, H1N1 is considered a seasonal flu and is pretty much entrenched in our system. The availability of a vaccine has also helped change the perception of this disease. So there is a flu vaccine which is available, which covers not only H1N1 but other influenza strains which are circulating. And it's an annual vaccine because the virus keeps changing a little bit every year, so it has to be taken every year. We travelled to the Serum Institute of India in Pune to explore one such swine flu vaccine. The institute has developed a vaccine in the form of a nasal spray, which is believed to be more effective than an intravenous route. The doctors here have created a vaccine which uses weakened form of the flu virus. These enter our bodies through the nasal passage. Their presence stimulates the immune system to create antibodies, like all other vaccines do and these can then battle the disease. These antibodies are going to protect you against infection. Now what is the best part of intranasal vaccine is because it, the antibodies developed are at the site of infection. You stop the virus, infect, virus from entering itself. Now, it doesn't even enter, you stop it at the point of entry. And therefore it tends to be a very good vaccine and effective vaccine. Now that we have explored one disease in detail, let us step back and explore the history of pandemics. These are not recent occurrences. They have been pandemics way back in time. Like the plague of Justinian that broke out in 541 CE in the Byzantine Empire. It is estimated to have caused the deaths of 100 million people worldwide, which is like one in four people in the eastern Mediterranean region. 800 years down in the 14th century, the plague returned to cause fresh havoc. Known as Black Death, it killed 20 to 30 million Europeans in six years. Till the 18th century, there were more than a hundred plague epidemics in Europe alone. Smallpox epidemics in the 15th century devastated the Americas when European settlers first arrived here. This disease is credited with the deaths of millions of native people in the United States and Central America. In 1918, close on the heels of World War I, the Spanish flu of 1918 is widely considered to be one of the most vicious pandemics in history. A worldwide phenomenon, it is estimated to have infected one-third of the world's entire population and eventually killed as many as a hundred million people. And these are not the only ones. Typhus, cholera, malaria have all haunted civilizations and continue to haunt us. But let us move past the history of these diseases to the mechanism in place to handle them. What happens when a pandemic hits India? We head to the National Centre for Disease Control to see how protocols are put in place for any major outbreak. Once meant only for contagious diseases, this institute plays a pivotal role in handling the management of many outbreaks, pandemics and epidemics. All diseases which are of public health importance, so, uh, the information about these diseases are being collected as a routine on a weekly basis. And that information from the village comes to the district and then in turn to the states and this information is being analyzed and that is how we generate, we call it early warning signals of uh, different, uh, I would say, impending outbreak. The institute has a 24-7 disease monitoring cell geared to monitor and respond to any outbreak of a disease. The moment there are signs of an outbreak like more people affected by a disease than is normal, the NCDC network is alerted and the response team is sent out into the field to contain or eradicate the threat. In every district, we have a multidisciplinary rapid response teams which consist of a public health person, uh, a clinician, a laboratory person and if need be, if we are dealing with mosquito-borne diseases, then an entomologist. During many pandemics, 
the NCDC becomes the center for the monitoring mechanism of the disease. This includes testing, as well as the distribution of medicines and the issuing of protocols to hospitals to cope with any outbreak. So we've seen some of the history of pandemics, explored the evolution and steps to contain H1N1 and the systems in place to handle a pandemic in India. After the break, we will explore other pandemics like AIDS and agricultural disasters, as well as biological threats like anthrax. We now move to another pandemic that shook the world like no other. I'm talking about HIV or the human immunodeficiency virus, which led to the AIDS pandemic which has killed over 35 million people worldwide. So how did this pandemic originate? The earliest documented case of HIV is believed to be in 1959 in Congo, but it was actually recognized as a disease in 1981 in Cameroon. From Africa, this deadly virus spread across the world and today, according to UN AIDS, there are approximately 3.67 crore people worldwide living with HIV AIDS at the end of 2015. Now, HIV is a virus that attacks the immune system, which is our body's natural defense against illness. The virus destroys a type of white blood cell in the immune system called a T helper cell and makes copies of itself inside these cells. This disintegration of the immune system leads to AIDS or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. When it comes to HIV, it comes to someone who comes to someone, then it comes to the virus like flu symptoms. लेकिन वो 10-15 दिन के बाद 5-7 दिन के बाद वो सिम्टम्स ठीक हो जाते हैं। उसके बाद वो बिल्कुल एसिम्टोमेटिक होता है जब तक उसको एड्स नहीं होती है। एड्स का मतलब होता है एक्वायर्ड इम्यूनोडेफिशिएंसी सिंड्रोम जिसमें कुछ बीमारियां पेशेंट कुछ पकड़ लेता है और कुछ एड्स डिफाइनिंग इलनेसेस भी होती हैं अगर ये हो गई पीसीपी न्यूमोनिया हो गया क्रिप्टोकल मेनिनजाइटिस हो गया या ट्यूबरक्लोसिस हो गया तब हम कहते हैं एड्स डिफाइनिंग इलनेसेस हैं और इस पेशेंट को एड्स हो सकता है और इनको एड्स का एचआईवी का टेस्ट करना चाहिए The virus reached India in 1996. The first case was found among female sex workers in Chennai. Other high-risk groups emerged, injecting drug users, men having sex with men, and clients of sex workers. It then started spreading to the general population. The National AIDS Control Organization was the nodal agency that handled this pandemic in India. There were many campaigns without their messaging on use of condoms, on homosexuality, issues that were usually swept under the carpet in an Indian context. This helped bring in a big degree of awareness and remove some of the stigma associated with this illness. But it was medical innovation that changed the dialogue around HIV. With the advent of ART or antiretroviral therapy, HIV was transformed into a manageable condition. In India, all government hospitals distribute the drug free of cost to any patient with HIV. These medicines treat the condition, they are not a cure. However, when taken in combination, they can prevent the growth of the virus. When the virus is slowed down, so is HIV disease. अगर मेरे को एचआईवी इन्फेक्शन है और मैं दवाई नहीं ले रहा हूं तो कई बार मिलियंस कॉपीज होती हैं लेकिन जब हम दवाई लेते हैं तो ये काउंट जीरो के आसपास पहुंच जाता है तो ये वायरस को सप्रेस करके रखता है जिस दिन मैंने दवाई बंद की वायरस फिर वापस आएगा दीज ड्रग्स आर गिवन एवरी मंथ टू अ पेशेंट एंड एज लॉन्ग एज दे आर टेकन एज प्रिस्क्राइब्ड द पेशेंट कैन लीड अ नॉर्मल लाइफ एआरटीज आल्सो ड्रास्टिकली रिड्यूस द रिस्क ऑफ ऑनवर्ड ट्रांसमिशन ऑफ एचआईवी बिटवीन पार्टनर्स as well as between an expecting mother and her child. Huge reductions have been seen in rates of death and infections when use is made of a potent ART regimen. Today's date, the drug is so good that you have to eat one drink at night at 9 o'clock, I will eat the next night at 9 o'clock, and I will eat the whole night at 9 o'clock, so I don't need anything else to do. I will go a normal man, so it will not be the name of AIDS. 
In India, the bold awareness and prevention efforts along with the medical model changed the way people perceived the disease. More importantly, unlike many other parts of the world, the number of people having HIV has dropped in India. The total number of people living with HIV in India in 2007 was 22.26 lakhs. In 2015, this figure went down to 21.17 lakhs. A small but distinctive and hopeful downward spiral. But for every disease, we find an answer for new ones to crop up. The next global pandemic, for example, could be the Nipah virus. It hit Indian shores in 2018, primarily in the state of Kerala. 17 people died, many more were quarantined. The NCDC determined that the source of the infection was a bat-infested well where locals drew water. The Nipah virus naturally resides in fruit bats across South and Southeast Asia and can spread to humans through contact with the animal's bodily fluids. There is no vaccine and no cure. The virus was first identified during an outbreak in 1998 among pig farmers in Malaysia, where it killed over a hundred people and led to the slaughtering of more than one million pigs. Cases now appear almost annually in Bangladesh. The system this time managed to bring in safeguards and the virus was contained. So what are the safeguards that need to fall into place to prevent the spread of a disease? The first step is adequate surveillance to spot signs of a disease spreading faster than it should. Next up, we need to make sure we have a strong disease response infrastructure labs for testing, a strong clinical system and efficient government mechanisms. A key step is to track and isolate everyone infected with the disease. This can prevent the spread to larger communities and hence contain the outbreak. Over the next decade or two, the Indian Disease Control Establishment will have to fight several diseases other than Nipah. The Ebola virus has still not come to India but is being closely watched by Indian epidemiologists. Dengue fever and chikungunya are spreading fast and can cause major outbreaks in the future. The Zika virus has arrived in India and is likely to be a huge threat for our country. All very scary, but let's take a step away from diseases and humans. When we talk of biological disasters, this includes outbreaks of plant contagion, insect or other animal plagues and infestation. Take the locust. Seems pretty harmless. It doesn't bite, nor is it poisonous. Yet, this harmless insect has caused huge devastation historically and even today. More about agricultural disasters after the break. And then we move to biological threats where microbes are used as weapons. What can be done to guard against this? Keep watching to find out. We're looking at disasters that can hit our plant population, like the whitefly. This tiny sap-sucking insect is often found on the underside of leaves. These can cause two types of damage to a plant. The first is direct damage. Whiteflies injure plants by sucking juices from them, causing leaves to yellow, shrivel and drop prematurely. If the number of whiteflies per leaf are great enough, it could possibly lead to plant death. The second, indirect damage, happens when the fly transmits viruses from disease to healthy plants through their mouthparts. Among the different crop pests, this is one of the serious pests of cotton and other crops. It is a long range of host plants. More than 900 plants have been affected by this white fly. The curious thing about the white fly is that it has also become resistant to many commonly used pesticides. And so, scientists have come up with special regimens combining the use of genetically modified strains that are resistant to the insect with innovative organic pest management techniques. Like the yellow sticky trap, a simple innovation to trap the white fly. A yellow colored adhesive is layered on the plant. The insect is attracted to this color. 
once it lands on the plant, it quite naturally sticks to it and hence can be trapped. Now let's see how a threat like anthrax, which affects animals, can be used to cause devastating harm. For that, we need to travel to the USA in 2001. A series of letters started arriving at news agencies in Florida and New York and a congressional office building in Washington. These were laced with anthrax spores. 22 people were infected and 5 died over the ensuing months. Over 32,000 people took antibiotics after possible exposure to anthrax. No one was ever caught for this crime, though the FBI interviewed thousands of suspects. So how does anthrax work? Anthrax is an infection caused by a rod-shaped bacteria called Bacillus anthracis. These bacteria make spores, a form of germ covered by a protective shell. The spores can live for years in the soil and they cause anthrax when they enter the body. The disease is most common in farm animals like sheep, cows and goats. But it can affect humans. There's a small chance that people can get it as well usually from some type of contact with an animal or part of an animal that had anthrax. We meet with Professor Rakesh Bhatnagar to get a better understanding of this disease. If human beings contact anthrax and if they are not treated immediately and you wait until the symptoms appear, which takes about two to five days, death is almost guaranteed. He has been working on the production of an anthrax vaccine in his laboratory here. The vaccine is genetically engineered to combat the disease. It has worked with mice, rabbits and other species, but has still not been humanized. But if that happens, it could be a significant step in the battle against this biological agent. We have taken Bacillus anthracis and uh, cloned a gene called uh, protective antigen gene, which makes a protein called protective antigen. Once it is injected in the animal or in human body, it can give rise to the antibodies against protective antigen. Now the big worry today is diseases like anthrax can be used as weapons. With huge advances in science, humans have weaponized many more of nature's most formidable viral, bacterial and fungal foes. How do we protect ourselves? There are some safeguards in place. For example, biological weapons are outlawed under 1972's Biological Weapons Convention and the Geneva Protocol. But while a number of nations have long destroyed their stockpiles of bioweapons and ceased research into their proliferation, the threat remains. During the past century, more than 500 million people died of infectious diseases. As we wipe out one threat, a new one surfaces. Our solace in this time is that the advances in science and the infrastructure are hopefully in place to handle each new disaster.